Nej. God bless. Halleluja. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6 again. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the rest of the chapter tonight uh, as we have been looking at the race of faith. And this year is a year of Olympics, and uh, Olympics are exciting. Amen. Um, if you have ever seen the movie Chariots of Fire, how many have seen that? Uh, years ago, we showed it in the church here. Now, probably for today's audience, it moves a little slow, but the story is powerful. It's incredible. Uh, the story of Eric Liddell, and uh, you know, he was raised as a, a Chinese missionary child, and uh, uh, he went after and gave his life for China to preach the gospel, but uh, uh, <clears throat> if you know the story, he had to, uh, as he was like Scotland's best athlete, uh, he was very fast, and so uh, he had to make a choice, though, because the 100 meters dash, which he excelled at, uh, was on Sunday, and he had convictions, that's the Lord's day. And so he made a decision, I'm not going to run on that day. And so he ran the 400 meter yard, uh, 400 meter dash, which was during the weekday, and won a gold medal, set the world record as he did that. Uh, and, uh, but what a powerful testimony you can see there from uh, the movie Chariots of Fire. But he said this, I think this applies to uh, this series of messages. He said, you came to see a race today to see someone win. It happened to be me, but I want you to do more than just watch a race. I want you to take part in it. I want to compare the faith to running in a race. It's hard. It requires concentration of will, energy of soul. Amen. How true that is. And our launch text for this study of the book of Hebrews is Hebrews 12, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. He's saying, it, imagine that in the spiritual realm, we're in the Olympics. Amen. And in eternity, uh, the Olympics will pale in comparison to the race that we're running. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, speaking of running an endurance race, incredibly, uh, Bob Wieland on Thursday, November 6, 1986, at 40 years of age, set the world marathon record in the New York City Marathon. Crossing the finish line, Whelan shouted, we love New York, and repeatedly pumped his arms into the air. Um, I think we have a picture of him we could maybe show. He set the record for the slowest marathon ever ran. Uh, it started on Sunday, he finished on Thursday. His legs were blown off in a Vietnam battlefield 17 years earlier in 1969. And so he was able to finish that race, uh, uh, but it took him four days, two hours, 48 minutes, and 17 seconds. He claimed the trophy and uh, they were asking, why did you do it? He said, for the same reason as 20,000 other people, it's the greatest marathon in the country. Now, people from Boston might debate that. <laughs> but he also cited three specific reasons. To sh First of all is to demonstrate his Christian faith. Then to test his conditioning and then finally to promote the Council on Physical Fitness, the President's Council, uh, of which he was a member. But he said this, success is not based on where you start, it's where you finish, and I finished. The first step was the most difficult. After that, we were on our way home 
The joy has been the journey. Amen. That ought to be true for our race that we run. Amen. The joy is the journey. I, you know, I want to say that it's such a joy to serve God with the people of God, the best people in the world, to be in the house of God. You know, when I came here from Toronto and, uh, you know, the, the nice building, incredible sound crew and, you know, all that they have here is beautiful. But I don't really think about that. What I think about is the people. Yeah. Amen. What incredible people are in the Tucson church. And we are blessed to be able to run this race together. Yes. Hallelujah. So let's read uh, Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 9 through to verse 20, where it says, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Though we speak in this matter, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation is for them an end of all dispute." Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So I want to begin by thinking about the truth. You better stay the course. Amen. And we're looking at God's better way. And we've seen in the book of Hebrews so far that Jesus is better. He's better than the prophets, better than the angels, better than Moses, better than Joshua. And this theme of better is going to continue on. But it's also something that should be demonstrated in our walk with God and in, in the race that we run. Because of his influence, we ought to be better. Amen. I know that if you were to look at my BC before Christ and look at my AD after I died and, uh, amen, surrendered my life to Jesus, amen. The A.D. is so much better. My life now is incredibly uh, better than it was before I got saved. And that's true, amen. It's a better life. We're going to read in chapter 8, it's based on better promises, amen. Yeah, wonderful things. And so as the author of Hebrews is writing to these people. He's referenced those who have fallen by the wayside, uh, who've abandoned their faith, uh, and these people are being tempted. Uh, there's persecution, there's challenges, there's difficulties. Uh, that is the nature of life and the Christian life. We're all going to face those, and these people bailed out of the race. But he says this in verse 9, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. He says when it comes to the faith, those people that have abandoned, that have, you know, left the course, he said, you're better than that. Because Christ is at work in you. Amen. We're better than those who want to put Jesus back on the cross. Better than those whose lives are like the thorns and the thistles. Uh, because we're saved, because we're serving God, we're better than that. 
Now, Pastor Warner spoke this morning about those who have abandoned the race and what a tragedy that is. I could name countless amounts of people that are no longer running. Amen. They've tripped, fallen, abandoned the Christian life. Running better is about determining we're going to make it to the finish line. Amen. If Bob Whelan with no legs could make it to the end of the finish line, all of us can make it. Right. Right. Amen. And he's talking about the better things that accompany salvation. How many know salvation is a better life? It's a life of hope, a life of promise a life of fruitfulness uh, that makes impact. Uh, God has a plan for every single person that surrenders their life to him. Amen. He has a destiny. He has a calling. He has a place of service for every one of us. Don't write yourself out of the script. There's a place for you. And I think what's so much better about the Christian life is that we have a relationship with God. Amen. That was the thing that blew my mind. Before I got saved, I thought Christianity, you know, it's a religion. It's a certain set of beliefs. It's, uh, you know, maybe some disciplines. You go to church, you do some other things. But when I got saved, I thought, I found out, you know, it's far more than that. It's this relationship. It's like God's real in my life. And, and we have a relationship with the Trinity, all three members of the Godhead. God the Father. I remember as a Christian, just living for God one day, God spoke to me. And I always can tell when it's God speaking because I'm not thinking it. It's not something I'm meditating on. And I just felt God say to me, Mike, I'm your father. My dad had died when I was 10, but God wanted to communicate of his initiative that I'm here for you. I'll take care of you. I'll provide. Amen. What an incredible thing that God initiates a relationship with us. Think about that. It's not just we're thinking about it and making it up. It's from his initiation. And then... The Son, God the Son, how He is our high priest. He's at the right hand of God. When we have a need, we have a burden, we go to Him. He helps us with issues of sin, to get over it, to experience forgiveness, the cleansing of our conscience, uh, making us whole on the inside. Hallelujah. And then there's the Holy Spirit. How many know we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? He gifts us. He empowers us. Uh, he begins to speak to our lives. And, and so these dynamics come into play in the Christian life. It's a better life. And if you're here and you're, you've never given your life to God, amen, it's a relationship. It's not a religion. And he talks about the better way of love. You know, in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, Pastor Warner was preaching about love this morning. But he says, you know what, here's the gifts of the Spirit, but I show you a better way, a more excellent way, and it's the way of love. <laughs> How many know love is better than hate? It's better than indifference. Having a love relationship with the people of God, with the work of God, and, and primarily with God. We love God. And because we love him, we want to work for him. And that's what it's talking in verse 10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name. You know, your labor of love is because you love God. But then it gets channeled into the church, into the people of God. He says, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Your labor of love. You work for God because you love God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Obedience flows out of a love for God. It's not that we have to do it. It's we want to please God. And here he calls these people ministers. In that you minister. 
and do ministry. You have ministered, but you continue to do that. Uh, and the thought of minister is someone who serves or renders assistance, who helps people. Amen. It's the thought of someone who's willing to do the menial things. You know, they don't have to be a high flyer. They don't have to be an important person. They'll take the form of a servant just like Jesus did. He didn't think equality with God was something to be grasped, but he laid that down to come and minister. And that's the spirit of the church, people who are willing to get involved, help people, go the extra mile, be a blessing. I could name so many people in the church, uh, but I think about Larry and Jerry Priest, you know, here they are just standing outside, greeting people, welcoming people, just what an incredible ministry. Just a smile when people come in the door. They come early so they can be here just to greet people. I think about Beto and Terry Lopez, prayer warriors. They're always in their prayer room. They're just praying. You know, they don't make a big fuss about it, but how many know if God's presence in the service is because people contend and lay hold of God for his presence and his power. And so many other ministries that we could talk about, people that just love God, and because they love God, they love others. And they're here. And whatever needs to be done, count me in. A team took off, went to Clifton, amen, just to go help, to be a blessing. Thank God for that. Hebrews 13, 16 makes this statement, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Something else that Eric Liddell said he said this to his sister. He said, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Hallelujah. You know, if one of your children has a skill or a talent or an ability and you see them use that, it, what, what delight it brings. I just got yesterday, uh, my son-in-law Steve in North Carolina sent uh, some video footage of Ben, my grandson, 10 years old. He's pitching uh, Little League Baseball, and he struck out the side. Wow. Amen. I'll tell you, it was like, brought pleasure to me. <laughs> when we see our children excel, do something, you know, when we see their personalities begin to develop, it brings delight to the soul of a parent or a grandparent, and that's a picture of God. He looks at people in service, and it makes his heart glad. Mark 9, verse 41, Jesus said it this way, For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. You know, maybe someone's thirsty and you get them a bottle of water. There's a reward. <laughs> Heaven takes note. Hallelujah, the people that serve in Cafe Globe. Well, the people that serve, you know, there's so many things we do that involve food. Heaven takes, no. Brings joy to the heart of God. Second John 8, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. He's saying, you know what, don't fall short. Make sure that you get the full reward that God intends for your life. So the great need that we have is to stay on co course. And this really, this is what the passage of Scripture is saying. And I want to read this in the message translations. Um, it's, um, I was talking to Sister Rachel Vagoda, and she was just saying how she listens to the message translation and likes it because it's kind of down to earth, you know, where we live. Um, and to give you an example of that, 2 Kings 18, 27, the New King James Version says this, 
to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste. You know, sometimes the scripture can be blunt, but this is the way Eugene Peterson translated, which is more what the people in Bible times, this is how they would have received it. They'll be eating their own turds and drinking their own pee. These people that are disobeying God in rebellion, it's like, this is where you're going with this life choices you're making. And uh, your rebellion against God is not going to serve you well. And so it's very blunt. And so Eugene Peterson, what, you know, he knew the original languages. And he said, sometimes in the translation, the spirit is lost. You know, the essence of what's being said. And so uh, the message translation kind of captures what I'm trying to say when we talk about the race of faith. I want to read what he says here. He says, I'm sure that won't happen to you, friends. I have better things in mind for you. Salvation things. God doesn't miss anything. He knows perfectly well all the love you've shown him by helping needy Christians and that you keep at it. And now I want each of you to extend that same intensity toward a full-bodied hope and keep at it till the finish. Don't drag your feet. Be like those who stay the course with committed faith and they get everything promised to them. When God made his promise to Abraham, he backed it to the hilt. Putting his own reputation on the line, he said, I promise that I'll bless you with everything I have. Bless and bless and bless. Abraham stuck it out and got everything that had been promised to him. When people make promises, they guarantee them by appeal to some authority above them so that if there is any question that they'll make good on the promise, the authority will back them up. When God wanted to guarantee his promises, he gave his word a rock solid guarantee. God can't break his word and because his word cannot change, the promise is likewise unchangeable. And listen to what he says. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God where Jesus, running on ahead of us, has taken up his permanent post as high priest for us in the order of Melchizedek. So the message that's being driven home here is, you know what, you're better than those people who have abandoned the race. And make sure you keep up. Stay the course. Stay the course of loving people. Keep your work and labor of love active. Don't ever surrender that. In verse 11, and we desire that each of one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. You know, it's one thing to start the race, to be a servant, to invest in people, but he's saying, don't ever let that go. Galatians says it this way, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Stay diligent until you finish. When he says, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, he's saying, keep at it. Keep at it. Don't abandon the call. Don't let weariness, frustration, and the challenges that people bring to your life deter you, set you off course. Keep pressing ahead. And then in verse 12, he says, don't let yourself become lazy. Verse 12, that you do not become sluggish. And if you look at any Greek translation of that, they'll trans the first word is lazy. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. 
You know, I have to say that I have to work harder as, that, as I get older. <laughs> it's easy to feel lazy. Oh, I don't know. You know, sometimes we live in Saurita, and, you know, driving in for prayer in the morning, it's like, I don't feel like it. <laughs> but I do. I mean, and I take time off. That was, we already discovered that in chapter four. We need to rest. But we need to be careful that we don't give in to this sluggishness that wants to capture our hearts. Again, the message translation. And now I want each of you to extend that same intensity toward a full-bodied hope. Keep at it till the finish. Don't drag your feet. Be like those who stay the course with committed faith and then get everything promised to them. You know, I think this is especially true when we're in the middle of our race. You know, when we start the race, there's enthusiasm and but then you get to the middle point where it's like, wait a minute, it's a long ways back to the starting line. I still got a long ways to go. <laughs> reading the story of the USS Astoria, which was the first US cruiser in World War II to engage the Japanese during the Battle of Savo Island. And on the night of August 8th, uh, 1942, uh, the ship, though it scored, it took a couple of uh, ships out from the Japanese Navy, it was badly damaged. And around 2 a.m., sig signalman, third class Elgin Staples was swept overboard because uh, there was a blast that hit an eight inch gun turret. It exploded and it knocked him into the water over the side of the ship and he was half dazed. And, uh, but he had a narrow life belt. We have a picture of the, this type of life belt. And there was some canisters that were hooked to it. And as he pulled the canister, it filled with air. And it kept him alive for four hours until another ship, the USS President Jackson, was able to come by and save him. So then what happened was that they took him back to the original ship and they, they were trying to save the ship, but then it went down too. So he's back in the water, but because there were two canisters, he was able to pull the second one and he was able to survive and eventually uh, he made it and they discharged him because of the injuries and all that he went through. But as he was riding away, he was just looking at this belt that had twice saved his life. And he noticed on it that there were some numbers that were written. And so when he got back home, uh, this was manufactured by Firestone, the tire and rubber company in Akron, Ohio. And it had a registration number there. And so, you know, he went home, he's telling to his family all that had happened and describing the belt uh, uh, to the point where he even remembered the numbers and he spoke the numbers and he asked his mother, you work for Firestone, what, what does that mean? And she said, well, those are the personal codes that when, uh, when this is produced and it passes inspection, the inspector's numbers are put on that. And she said, what were those numbers? And he, by memory, spoke them, and she said, those are my numbers. Wow. So here is a mother, she's, you know, I mean, you're making belts like that, it's not a glamorous job. Working overtime to fuel the war effort. She's just doing her business, working hard. Little did she know that her commitment and faithfulness saved her own son's life. You know, our name is stamped on our work. And in eternity, that people were saved 
because we were faithful. Maybe not a lot of attention. Wasn't really glamorous what we were involved in, but people are saved. Your diligence might just save someone. A few weeks ago, um, Brother Kevin Gurry had a little kind of thing in uh, memory of Ralph Tapia where we just kind of shared some old stories about him. He died, and, and so he invited some people I haven't seen in 40-some years. Louis Menager, Del Cadill, uh, some of you would recognize those names. But as we were there, it just brought my memory back. I said, you know, it was because of you guys that I made it. I, I stayed saved. I mean, you guys reached out. You invited me to fellowship. I'm not sure I would be here if it wasn't for that investment, that interest, that coming alongside my life. Don't let yourself grow dull. He says here in verse 12 that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. And then it gives us the example of Abraham. And we know Abraham is 75 years old. He's in the year of the Chaldees. Uh, and God says to him, Abraham, I want you to separate yourself. I want to show you a land that I have for you. And you're going to have descendants. Well, Sarah was barren. They couldn't have children. But God gives him a promise. It didn't happen the next week, the next month the next year, or even the next decade, 25 years later, God finally comes through and his timing is perfect. But think about Moses. For him, those tuggings on his heart took 40 years. The same with Caleb and Joshua. 40 years before they ever saw fulfillment to what God said he was going to do. For Joseph, it was 13 years. So it says here, we need to keep running until the race is over. Keep your eagerness. Don't let that fall by the wayside. So with that in mind, let's think about the basis of our confidence, because this is what the scripture is talking about. Our confidence is in the character of God. Three times it says in the passage, we, the word hope. Hope is the positive orientation of the mind towards an expected good. We have hope this is going to work out for the good. And that carries us forward. Even in times when we're not seeing all we want to see, difficult times, we find the word assurance in this passage. And also the phrase strong consolation. Amen. We're... This is a strong encouragement to our souls. We need confidence. If we're going to serve with the zeal, the enthusiasm, we need to be confident that God's in control. Hebrews 3, verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Verse 14 of chapter 3, For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. And Hebrews 10, 35, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Don't throw it away. The basis of our confidence is if God promises, he's good for that promise. In fact, it says it's impossible for him to lie. Amen. There are so many promises in the Bible that God gives us. Incredible promises. And God is good for every one of them. So let's look at our text again, verse 13 to 18. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, 
saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. There's a double emphasis there. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. So when you're talking to someone and you say, you know what, I'm going to do this. I swear to God. Some people might say, I swear on my grandmother's grave. When someone's elected to office, they put their hand and they swear on God's word. You can count on it. I'll faithfully discharge these duties. I'm good for this task, for this responsibility. For in, men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. Amen. We say, I swear to God. God says, I swear to myself. Amen. He has no one else. <laughs> the two things. Jesus would say, verily, verily, I say to you, or some translations say, truly, truly. The double speak means this is serious. You can bank on it. We find God saying, listen, blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. We don't doubt today that the Jews were multiplied, the seed of Abraham, and we are brought into that, grafted into the branch. Amen. The descendants, both physical and spiritual, of Abraham are incredible. God was good for his word, even though for 25 years, Abraham's probably wondering, did I really hear from you? You ever feel that way? But God is good for it. That's our confidence. 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God are in him, yes, and in him, amen. There's the double emphasis to the glory of God. So let's conclude with running for our lives. Amen. Hebrews 6.18, again, the message translation. God can't break his word, and because his word cannot change, the promise is likewise unchangeable. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. He says, we that have fled to God. You know, we have to flee. What are we fleeing from? Well, we're fleeing from uncertainty, doubt, unbelief, like those other people that are no longer in the race. We flee away from our fears, our self-doubts, our sense that I'm too old for this. I don't have what it takes. These Christians were... Hebrew Christians were fleeing persecution, trying to get away from it. We're fleeing sin. You have to run away from sin. Amen. You can't just delicately play with it. You got to be serious and get far away from sin. The Bible says, flee youthful lust. Flee fornication. Don't go there. The Bible says, flee idolatry. Flee covetousness, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Get away from it, the scripture says. We're fleeing hell. How many know that? We're trying to get as far away as possible from hell. And hell is running after us. Why Peter said, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, 
walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, if there are bad people in the street, run into the house. Amen. There's a lot of evil in the world. We need to run to the high priest, Jesus, the one who cares for us, protects us, will keep us. Verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. A refuge, a place of safety, protection. Where we're taken care of. Where the evil and the bad can't get in. It's in Jesus. Verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Now, there's a picture here that's being given. In the Old Testament, only the high priest could go in to the Holy of Holies, uh, and there was a curtain that separated, and no one could go in. But Jesus has gone in, and when he died, the veil was rent. Amen. But it's a picture of the veil of death. And God who lies beyond it. And no one knows what's there. But Jesus ran through it. Amen. He's made a way through the veil of death. So we don't have to be fearful of death. And we're all, unless the rapture happens soon, we're all going to taste death. But we don't have to fear because he's gone through. He's made a way. Verse 20, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. You know, he's made a way. He's passed that way. And he's there waiting for us. He said, listen, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you might be. Amen. He's paved the way. He is the forerunner who has gone before. F.F. Bruce, and I close with this, said this, Jesus, that is to say, is presented as the one who has blazed the trail of faith and as the one who himself ran the race of faith to its triumphant finish. And we are following in his path. Let's bow our heads together. Every head bowed, our eyes are closed just for a moment as we pause. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Hallelujah. Tonight, if you've come in but you're not saved, you don't know the Lord, You know what God desires with all of us is a relationship. The nature of God is that he is a father. And he desires a relationship with all of us. When God said to me that day, Mike, I'm your father. That really blew my mind. My dad died when I was 10. I didn't have a father, but God said, I'm your father. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Jesus gives us forgiveness. And I needed forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I had done a lot of bad things. And yet, Jesus paid the price for that himself. And he was able to cleanse my conscience. And we're going to see that in the book of Hebrews. Are you carrying around a guilty conscience? There's freedom that comes from Jesus. And there's the Holy Spirit. When I came into a church like this, it was the Holy Spirit tugging on my heart. Drawing me. 
I wasn't expecting it. It was God himself pulling on my heart. And if you're here, you're in this place, uh, amen, God's Holy Spirit dealing with your heart because he loves you, because he wants to forgive you, because he wants to have a relationship with you. But he won't force that. We have a choice. But if we'll open our heart, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. Are you willing? He's willing. Are you? While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, would you slip up your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I I'm willing. God's dealing with me. I feel my need for Christ. I wanted to know that my sins are forgiven, that I have a home in heaven. Pray for me. Slip up your hand very quickly all over this place. In honesty, we want to pray for you. God's dealing with you. You're not where you need to be with God. There's a hand over here to my left. God bless you. Sister, you can put your hand down. Thank God. Others say, me too. I, I want to be saved. want to know that heaven will be my home. That my sins are forgiven. Amen. Jesus loves you. Has a plan for your life. Can we pray for you? Slip up your hand. Say, that's me. Amen. Maybe you at one time were running the race. God bless you over here in the middle. Thank God for the honest heart. Maybe at one time you were running the race, but you got knocked out. Trials, circumstances, you tripped up. Amen. Thank God for this sister in the back. There are others over here. This man, I appreciate we have one here as well in the middle. God bless you. You can put your hand down. Amen. Jesus loves you. He wants to help you came to the woman in adultery. Where are your accusers? They all went away. He said, I don't accuse you. I'm here to get you on the right track. Go and sin no more. Amen. He wants to help us have a change of life. How many others? Just one last time you're here. Join these honest. Many hands have gone up. There are others. So you say, that's me. I want to pray. I want to get right with God. I need Jesus. I, amen. Thank God over here. You can put your hand down in the middle. God bless you. Over here, we have another hand. God bless you. Many, many lives. You're going to leave with the touch of heaven. God's going to help you. Amen. I'm going to ask all these that lifted your hand, just look up at me for a minute. Amen. Here in the middle, you meant that. In the back, sister, you meant that. I know over here. Amen. You meant that. Thank God for these honest hearts on my right. We're going to ask you to stand up and we want you to come down and we want to pray with you. Meet me right here at the front and there will be someone to pray with you. Would you slip out of your seat? Just stand up. Join these that are coming. Amen. Thank God for these honest hearts. Uh, just slip right out of your seat. Make your way down. We want to pray with you. Hallelujah. Thank God for these honest hearts. You can make your way out. Thank you, sir. Just make your way out. Come down here towards the back. We don't do this to embarrass you. We're going to open it up for everyone to come in just a minute, but we want to encourage you. Come down, find a place to pray. There'll be someone to pray with you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Others over here on my left, thank God for these in the back. God bless you, sister. Amen. Are you weary in well-doing? Hold fast your confidence to the end. Keep at it. Your life makes a difference. And God notices there's a reward. There's a need. You make a difference. Amen. And God has gifted you. He's dealing with you. Don't write yourself out of the script. Every one of us has a place in God's economy. Don't give up on that. Maybe you've been discouraged. Keep pressing on till the end. Show that diligence to the very end. We're going to stand and open the altars. God's helped you. Find a place to pray as we worship God together. Thank God for these honest hearts. Hallelujah. You are my strength. Strength like no other Strength like no other Reaches to me You are my
Father, we just bless your name. We give you glory and praise and honor. We do delight in you. We do magnify and exalt you. God, we rejoice in your goodness and mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I don't know about you, but I really sense the presence of God here, just ministering, helping, encouraging people. Amen. I do believe that tonight God's going to give people a fresh breath. Amen. A second wind, so to speak. Amen. In your service, in your life for God. I want to pray. Maybe we could just have you stand. I want to pray. God would do that very thing. That he would just breathe upon you the breath of his spirit. Invigorate your life. Amen. Give you a second wind. Hallelujah. And so we want to pray and just... Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, it's only by your spirit that I can serve. I can do nothing of myself, but I understand that through you, all things are possible. And Lord, I thank you that you take note of everything I do in your name. And I pray, help me to be an instrument that ministers to people, that encourages, that builds up, that through my life, others might be saved, might be strengthened, might be helped. And God, I'm asking for an anointing that goes beyond my ability and touches people's lives. God, I receive by faith, Lord, your spirit in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's give him praise again. Father, I'm praying God touch, help, edify, strengthen, encourage. Lord, visit even right now by your spirit, by your power, by your grace, by your unction, by your blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. There are some here you have, you feel like maybe I was just imagining God spoke some things to your heart, but grab on to that. Don't let go of it. The hope. God cannot lie. Amen. And I know that we can sometimes imagine things in our mind, but if you've got a word of prophecy, if the Lord has spoken to you, grab on to that. You feel it calling that God has something for you. Amen. Don't let go of that. Hang on to it. Be diligent. Press in. I wonder just as we dismiss, how many here you'd say, you know what? I've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit. The evidence is speaking in tongues, but I need God's spirit. I want to be full of his spirit. Is there, how many would there be? If that's you over here, just come right. We want to pray for you. Other people, you've never been baptized. Maybe you just gave your life to Christ. Uh, the Bible says that we should be baptized in the Holy Spirit and God is a giver of the spirit. So yeah, just come right there. That's good. Amen. Thank God for these honest hearts. How many more would there be? You're here. You're saved. Uh, you've given your life to Christ, but you're not full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank God. Numbers of people here. We're going to pray for you. The Bible says that God gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Amen. And if we ask, he gives it to us. It's a free gift. And so we're going to pray and we're going to ask God and you're going to ask God to give you the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in the day of Pentecost, the spirit was poured out and they began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. And I want to say that tongues is an incredible prayer language. Amen. It, it builds us up on the inside. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's a way of communicating with God because the Bible says we don't even know what to pray sometimes, but the Spirit helps us uh, making intercession according to the will of God. And it's like our spirit is praying, is a direct line of co communication with God. And that comes as we pray in tongues and speak in tongues. We're going to pray for you. The Bible says uh, that they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You will be the one speaking and he'll give you an utterance. You speak that forth, whatever the utterance is. It's not going to be English or French or whatever language, maybe Spanish. Uh, uh, it's going to be a supernatural language. And so we're going to pray for you right now. I want you just to lift up your hand and say, Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you. I need your Holy Spirit. I'm asking you to fill me. And Lord, I ask for forgiveness and for cleansing. And I break every curse. I forgive all that have sinned against me. Lord, I want my spirit to be free. And by faith, I receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues in Jesus name. Amen. Now let's lift our hands. Just begin to let the spirit flow through you. Speak out. Amen. Yaramando lobo bobo sandai rico bobo salamanda ribibibi anda la la bobo say that's it. Just let it come out. Yes. Yes. Let it come out. Touch our sister. Yoro lobo bobo sanda ribaba yando Be filled in Jesus' name. Right now, be filled. Just let it come out. Speak it out in faith. In the name of Jesus, be filled. Yaramosan. 
Mate, Rama Mukondo Moho, Stende Baba, Sanda Riba Bayara Baba, be filled in Jesus' name. Yele Baba Baba, Yele Baba, Randa Baba, Hallelujah, Sala Baba, Yele Baba, Bosi, Yendele Baba, Sala Bando, Robo Bosi. Yele babando, re babando, koshte bara liere baba sanda. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. I can see that God has really touched some people. Amen. You know, the first night when I got prayed for, I didn't receive it because I was just like so intimidated kind of just, you know. But the next day I was at home praying and it just came, I started speaking in tongues. It's uh, such a precious gift, amen. And some of you, you use that. The Apostle Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all. He says, I do this all the time. No wonder he was so powerful uh, because he used that gift. And just pray in tongues, spend some time, get before God, open your spirit to him and just let him begin to flow through you. And uh, amen, what an incredible gift. You know, we've had a Chinese lady who uh, came into the service and we had a brother. He just gave a message in tongues. It was Chinese to me and it was to her as well. She said, you know, that was Chinese. We never know, uh, it's supernatural, but it doesn't have to be a language. In fact, for the most part, it's not a human language. It's a divine language. The Bible says in our spirit, we speak mysteries. But you can be confident in that. Uh, you know, next, uh, just uh, on the 27th, we're going to have a water baptism service. And uh, I would encourage you to follow through and be baptized. Uh, uh, it's a command that Jesus gives. It's kind of the next step of faith. And I would encourage you to plan to be part of that. And you that have given your life to Christ, it'll be a great celebration. And uh, we're excited about that. Amen. Let's give God praise one more time. Hallelujah. Go tell them to register. Okay, some have already registered for baptism. I know you two did. And, uh, but you can sign up in the lobby, the, the, the desk there. Uh, you can go online at the door, uh, church, door.church, and you can sign up there as well. Uh, that way we can plan for it. Praise God. God's good. We appreciate everyone that's come out tonight. Our brother John Scheidt, would you dismiss us in prayer? Thank you for joining us online today. If you gave your heart to Jesus, congratulations. We would love to get in touch with you and share some encouragement through your next steps of faith. To help us do that, follow the link in the description that says New Believers Start Here. Below this, you can also find links to send prayer requests and questions to our pastors. While you're here, subscribe to our channel so you'll be notified next time we go live. See you then.